Good afternoon and welcome to Diving Deeper. This is week number six. We're talking about covenants tonight in the Old Testament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. So we are all here, uh, everybody's mask and distance and all of that, but you can see me only. But any questions from your reading the past week? You were finishing Genesis. Any questions? You okay? All right, then. We're going to talk about covenants. The Bible has a whole bunch of covenants, and we're going to kind of run through them tonight because the covenants begin in the Old Testament, uh, starting with Noah. Genesis chapter 5 through 9 uh, is about Noah and the ark and the flood and all of that sort of stuff. And what is going on in Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 5 is that the earth becomes full of violence and God is sad that he made human beings and he decides he's going to wipe it all out and start all over again. But Noah found favor with the Lord, it says. And it sounds like Noah is the only guy that's paying attention to God. Now you think, well, you know, it's been several hundred years and people are not listening. But remember, this is when people were living eight, seven, eight, nine hundred years. So the generate, though it was a long, long time, the generations are such that Noah can probably talk to a couple of generations back and get all the way to Adam. So people should know the stories of the origin. But the earth is full of violence. God is sad he's even made it all. Uh, and people are treating each other badly. And so God tells Noah, build the boat. It takes Noah 100 years to build the boat. Now, remember, this is a big old boat, about the size of a battleship. And he doesn't have any power tools. It's Noah and his three sons. And they're doing this all by hand. So for it to take 100 years, that makes sense. Okay, there is a life-size recreation of the ark in Kentucky. It's made out of wood. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I'm sure they must have used power tools because it didn't take them a hundred years to make it. But I've seen pictures of it. It's really cool. I haven't ever been there, but I've seen pictures of it. But Noah found favor with God because he listens to God. He pays attention to God. And in the story of of Noah, God speaks to Noah, and Noah never says anything back. Now, if you've heard Bill Cosby doing Noah, Bill Cosby and, uh, and, uh, as Noah and God have all of this dialogue. But in, it's what we hear in the Bible. God tells Noah to do stuff and Noah does it. He doesn't question God. He doesn't ask how to do it. He doesn't say, but what about? He just does it. So he builds the boat. He and his three sons. God brings the animals to him. He gets the animals into the ark and then God closes the door of the ark when it starts to rain. Now, this is the first recorded instance of rain in the Bible. According to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, um, springs came up and mists came up from the earth to water the ground. So when Noah says, it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, nobody knew what rain was. I'm not, a, yeah, right, it's going to rain. Water's going to come out of the sky, right. Well, it did for 40 days and 40 nights. But remember, in Middle Eastern time, 40 days is a long time. It may, you know, I don't know if you could count off 40 days and that was it, but it was a long time. It was long enough to flood everything. And the Bible says that the springs of the earth gushed their water up and the oceans uh, overflowed their boundaries and they did that. So Noah builds the ark. 100 years, puts the animals in there, God closes the door, it rains, the waters go up so that they're over all the mountains, everything dies. Noah and company are in the ark for a year. Now, why would it take that long to do that? Well, if you've got all these dead bodies floating around, don't you want them to be gone by the time the water goes away so you don't have stinky carcasses everywhere? breeding death and disease and flies and maggots and all that sort of stuff. So a year later, when the water subsides, there shouldn't be any of that left. 
So the waters subside. Noah sends out the raven. The raven doesn't come back because the raven, ravens do that. They can fly around. He found something. He just didn't come back. The dove came back. Dove comes back. So Noah knows we've got, we've got plants. We've got some ground. And God opens the door and says they can come out. They come out. And God puts a rainbow in the sky. And God makes a covenant with Noah. With Noah and all flesh. So that would be Noah and all people and all animals. The first covenant of the Bible is not just with human beings, it's also with all of the animals, with every living thing. You guess you could even say the plants if you want to, but every living thing. So what is covenant? A covenant is an agreement with some kind of sign, some kind of symbol that symbolizes that this agreement is in effect. Okay, we have covenants that we make. Marriage is a covenant and a ring is a sign of that covenant. This is not what makes me married. This is a symbol that I'm married. This is a sign that I'm married. Now, if I take my ring off, am I still married? Yes. Okay. If I just put a ring on, does that make me married? No. But this is in our culture, a ring on this finger is a sign that the person is married. Okay, so a covenant is an agreement between two parties with some, court of, some kind of sign or symbol. Now, a contract is also an agreement between two sides or more, two people, two groups. There's a difference between a covenant and a contract. They are very similar and they overlap, but there's a significant difference. A contract is between two people, and a contract is we make an agreement, you're going to pay me $50, and I'll mow your grass. Okay? We may sign a contract, we may shake hands, we may do a nod, but at some point we make this agreement with each other. Okay? If you don't pay me, if I mow your grass and you don't pay me $50, do you think I'm ever going to mow your grass again? Okay? If we make an agreement and I don't mow your grass, are you going to pay me? No, because the way the contract, the way a contract works, if, if you don't do your part, I don't have to do my part. If you don't do your part, you've broken the contract. You're in breach of contract. Now, you know, I can take you to court. I can sue you. I can talk nasty about you. I can do, you know, I can harangue you. I can do whatever. But the, the point is, if I don't do my part, you're not going to do your part. That's a contract. Okay. A covenant is different in that if we make a covenant with each other, if I don't do my part, you still do your part. And the significant part about God's making covenants with human beings is God always does his part whether we do ours or not. And this is why marriage is a covenant and not a contract. If marriage were merely a contract, then that would mean I would take my wedding vows, my wife would make her wedding vows. If one of us didn't all the way keep our wedding vows, the other one wouldn't have to either. How long would a marriage last if that were the case? Because who among us that's married has always kept all of our vows perfectly all the time? Not me. I mean, I want to, I try to, I keep them most of the time. But the reality is I don't always cherish my wife. I don't always treat her the way that I'm supposed to. I don't always treat her kindly. I'm selfish and I, I don't make excuses for it. But, you know, I try, but I, I can't do that. And if in a marriage, if, if one of the partners is unkind one day, does that mean the other one can be unkind too? That's, not, that's often what happens, but that's not what's supposed to happen because marriage is a covenant, not a contract. So God makes this covenant with all of living things. And the sign of a covenant is really important because without the sign, there's no evidence that you have the covenant. The sign is there to remind you. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't ever wake up and go, Gee, am I married today? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I am. But it does help remind me that I'm married. And it lets everybody else around me know that I'm married. So, you know, fewer people are going to be hitting on me. That was a joke. <laughs> but the sign of the covenant is not only for the two people who are, or the two groups that are in the covenant, it's for everybody else to see as well. 
So God makes this covenant with all living things. And God says, I promise I will never destroy the earth with a flood again. And as a sign of the covenant, I can put the rainbow in the sky. Now in central Florida, it rains on, sun, on in the afternoon in the summertime. If you look south, you can see rainbows a lot around here. Uh, and that's, a, that's the sign that God is not going to destroy the earth with a flood again. So no matter how much it rains around here, we don't have to worry. It's not going to flood the whole earth. And that's the symbol that's in the sky. That rainbow is in the sky. And that rainbow is not just for those of us who know about the covenant. That rainbow is for everybody. So you go, oh, that's really pretty. What does that mean? Well, you know, the light goes through the air and it hits the raindrops and a prism effect and it turns into a... No, that's... We, we who know about the covenant then get to tell people that's a symbol that God is... God is faithful to us. He's going to keep his part of the promise. Now, this first covenant, what's the human, what's the living people's part of the covenant? God says, I will never destroy the earth. What's the other side of the covenant that living things have to do for God? Nothing. The first covenant with all living things is all God making a promise. People don't have to respond. They don't have to do anything. The animals, the plants don't have to do anything. There's nothing to keep their part. There's no part of the bargain to keep. The first covenant that God makes with all living things is all God. Now, why would God bother to make a covenant that nobody else has to do anything? It's to show us that he's trustworthy. So the first covenant in the Bible is the one with God and all living things. He promises never to flood the earth. He puts the rainbow in the sky. Anytime the rainbow comes up, people are like, oh, yeah, God's keeping his promise. And several hundred years later, when Abraham comes along and God is going to establish a covenant with Abraham, Abraham can go, oh, yeah, you're that God that makes covenants and you've kept your promise. You've kept your promise for several hundred years Perhaps I can trust you to keep your promise to me. And once Abraham makes this, I mean, with God makes this covenant with Abraham, then Abraham does have a part. And Abraham can say, okay, I'll do my part because I've, I've, history shows that this God keeps his, his ends of the covenant. He is trustworthy. So if he's going to do his part, I'll do my part. All right. So the covenant is with Noah and all flesh. God asks humans to be fruitful. All God asks us to do is be fruitful and multiply. Okay, we're going to have kids anyways. He asked them later on, don't eat blood and don't shed human blood. But that's not even part of the covenant. God just asks us not to do that. Please don't kill people. Please don't kill people. Please don't kill people. Okay? And then when you kill an animal... Respect the blood because the life is in the blood. Don't drink the blood. Don't eat the blood. Drain the blood out onto the ground so that the life returns to the earth from which it came. Respect. If, if you're going to kill an animal, eat. we have permission to eat animals. God gives Noah permission to eat animals. He says, but at least res you still respect them as you take their life. Okay. God promises not to destroy the earth with a flood. The sign is the rainbow. He hasn't broken it yet even though we have, okay? So God makes the covenant with all flesh. Later on, several hundred years later, in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to come out from where you are, and I'm going to bless you, and everybody who blesses you, I will bless, and anybody who curses you, I will curse, and through you, I will bless everybody on the whole, the whole earth is going to be blessed through you. God, at this point, calls Abraham, he doesn't establish a covenant. Abraham doesn't know God well enough yet to enter into a deal. And God is gracious and God is kind and God does not expect us to do unreasonable things. And if you ha hear a, a voice in your head suddenly say you need to do this, that, and the other, if it makes sense, Okay, but if it doesn't make sense, I don't think so. So God promises Abraham what's going to happen. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the world, whole world through you. That, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? 
Yeah, okay. So why did God choose Abraham? Of all the people on earth, why did God choose Abraham? We don't really know when God chose him, but later on as we watch Abraham and as we read about Abraham, over and over and over again, every time God asks Abraham to do something, the Bible says Abraham immediately did it, or early the next morning he did it. Early the next morning he got up, saddled his donkey, and went off and did whatever God said. Early the next morning he got up and circumcised his son and himself. So Abraham is responsive to God. That's really what God wants from us, is to be responsive to be responsive, to say yes. Abraham continually says yes. He obeys God, he worships God, and he tithes. Story goes that some bad guys come uh, while Abra uh, and they, they beat up Abraham's nephew and kidnap him and his family and kidnap a bunch of other people and steal a bunch of stuff. And the bad guys pick up all the stuff and they take off uh, and they're going away and they're taking all of these hostages. And Abraham gets together a posse and goes out after him and beats them all up and sets everybody free and gets all the stuff back. And from the loot that Abraham gets from the bad guys, it's not only his stuff, but the stuff that they've stolen from other people. Abraham gives the king of what becomes Jerusalem, uh, a guy named Melchizedek, Abraham gives Melchizedek a tithe of all the loot that he captures. So this is the first instance in the Bible of tithing, of giving 10%. And Abraham gives this tithe to Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, which later becomes Jerusalem. Okay, Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. So Abraham's the guy, if you have a problem with tithing, blame it on Abraham. Okay? And Abraham's the first guy to do that. And that same number of one-tenth of our income or one-tenth of the produce that we raise or one-tenth of the stuff that we produce that we give to God, that's a number that continues on through the rest of the Old Testament. So Abraham listens to God. Abraham responds to God. Abraham obeys God. Abraham offers sacrifices and worships God. Abraham prays to God, and Abraham tithes to God. Sounds like a pretty good guy. I think we'd want him in our parish family. So in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham, and in Genesis chapter 15, uh, God speaks to Abraham again. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world through you and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea. And the Bible reports that Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believes. That's what God asks us to do. Believe it. And that would have been fine for about a verse. And then Abraham says, how do I know you're really going to do this? And God says, well, go get me a bull and a cow and a goat and a sheep and some birds. And Abraham goes and gets them, cuts the animals in half, lays the pieces out, and sits there and, and scares away the buzzards that are coming to try to eat the carcasses. And we read that and think, what? Because we don't know the history. In those days, there was a covenant called a king's covenant. And a king's covenant was the king or whoever the ruler was of the area. And he would make a covenant with his subjects, with the people who lived in his area. And the deal is this. I'm your king. I will look out for you. If war comes, we're gonna, I'm going to fight your battles for you. I'm going to try. I'm going to protect you. And your part of the deal is you're going to pay taxes. You're going to give me some of your stuff. And you're going to serve in my army. And you're going to do what I say. And the sign of the king's covenant was to take some animals and cut them in half and lay them sideways. And you would walk between those saying to me, the king, if you don't keep your part of the bargain, I can do to you what you did to those animals. Well, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? So Abraham knows about this king's covenant thing. And when God says, get the animals, Abraham knows what to do. And Abraham cuts them in half and lays them out and then sits there like, uh-oh. 
But Abraham doesn't walk between them. Can you blame him? He doesn't walk between them because God hadn't said anything about this yet. And Abraham waits all afternoon chasing away the buzzards until nighttime comes. It gets dark and Abraham's still waiting there. And in the darkness, a smoking fire pot appears. And the smoke, it's like a, like a piece of, uh, like a clay pot that has fire in it. In those days, they didn't have matches. They didn't have big lighters. So the way that you started a fire was you kept some fire from your last fire in a pot that was non-flammable. And then you could pull out some coals and start a new fire. Okay, so it gets dark. This smoking fire pot floats through the air in between those animals. Now, what was the smoking fire pot? It was the presence of God. God never asked Abraham to walk between the pieces. God himself walked between the pieces. And by doing so, God says to Abraham, if you don't keep your part of the bargain, I will do to myself what you did to those animals. Ooh. You may have heard the term cutting a covenant. That's where that comes from, cutting the animals in half. And God promises Abraham I'm going to bless all the world through you and I'm going to have a special relationship with you and you're going to do what I ask and do what I say. But if you don't, I will do to myself what you've done to those animals. Did God keep that promise? Look at a crucifix. No, Jesus' body wasn't literally split in half, but it was nailed to a cross and his body was split by the lash and the scourge before they nailed him to that cross. God offered himself as the sacrifice, as the penalty for our disobedience. So there in that covenant with Abraham, God says to Abraham, I will do to myself what you did to those animals. And God makes Abraham several promises. He says, you're going to have all of this land, but you're not going to get it yet. Your people are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. But I'm going to bring them out of Egypt with great wealth and riches. And then I'm going to give this land to your descendants. Well, when did that happen? In the Exodus. When we're going to, we're, you, you already read Genesis, so you already know about Joseph and going to Egypt and then his brothers going to Egypt and then all of them going to Egypt and then them living in Egypt. And as you start reading Exodus this next week, you're going to find out what happened is that a new king arose in Egypt that didn't know about Joseph and he enslaves the, the Israelite people. You already know about that part. So God kept his part of the promise. Yes. Abraham and his children, well, Abraham's descendants were put into slavery, but God brought them out in the Exodus. And when the people left Egypt, the, is, the Egyptians threw money at them, threw gold at them, threw all kinds of precious stuff at them. Get out of here. We don't want you killing any of other of our children. And God kept his promise, took them to the promised land, to what is today Israel, and gave it to them. So God makes a covenant with Abraham. And the sign of that covenant is those animals laid out there. Now, that covenant was just with Abraham and his descendants. And Abraham obeyed and God puts himself in the gap. The second covenant that God makes with Abraham is Genesis chapter 17. Uh, up to this point, Abraham is named Abram. Abram means exalted father. Jewish children call their daddy Abba. Abba. Abba means daddy. So Abraham or Abram means exalted father, important father, honored father, honored daddy, Abraham. So Abraham comes from that same root word of Abram. So in Genesis chapter 17, God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of nations, father of many father of thousands, father of millions. He changes Abram's name to Abraham and he promises Abraham children and land. And in this covenant, Abraham has to do what God says. And the sign of the covenant is circumcision. 
Abraham obeys, and the Bible says that very day he circumcised all the males in his household, all of his servants, his one son Ishmael, and he had him. I hope he didn't circumcise himself. That would, you'd have to be a real man to do that. <laughs> but he is circumcised as well. That's one of the reasons God picks Abram because immediately he does this. God says something. By this time, Abram does it. Now. The first time God talks to Abraham, he's 75 years old. At this point, Abram is almost 100 years old. So Abram's had this relationship with God for 25 years. I'm, I trust we haven't heard every time he and, he and God had a conversation. We, we hear about the important ones. But the point being, by the 25 years into this, Abram is really trusting God and sensitive to God and listening to God and doing what God says, including circumcising himself and the rest of the people in his household. And Abraham, Abraham, who he's now Abraham, obeys. Now, why would God pick circumcision? Now, I'm looking around the room. All of you know what that is, right? Okay. When I talk about this with teenagers, there are always some, often girls, who don't know what circumcision is. So if you're watching this and you don't know what it is, please Google it, and I hope they don't show you any videos. <laughs> circumcision. Why would God pick something that strange to be the sign of the covenant with himself? Well, first of all, it's a daily reminder to every man that he is in a relationship with God. Okay? Now, there are several things in Judaism that Jewish men do that are a symbol of their relationship with God. And one of them is a prayer shawl. Now, the prayer shawl, when they pray, is a symbol of God's covering them and watching over them and being present with them. But look at the tassels, okay? The tassels are there, and Jew uh, Orthodox Jewish men wear an undergarment under their shirt that has these same kind of tassels, and these tassels come out from underneath their shirt tail. So everywhere they go, they've got all these tassels. Now, why are the tassels there? That's a sign of who they are and their relationship with God. You see somebody wearing this? That's a Jew. That's a Jewish guy. And so that is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. We Christians call that a sacrament. Okay. So the sign of the covenant is the, um, the visible sign to the public is this. Circumcision, not so visible. But the guy knows it. And the guy has a daily reminder. Every time he looks down, every time he changes clothes, every time he goes to the bathroom, there's my symbol that I am in a relationship with God. Okay. It's a demonstration of how God wants to remove things from our life that are superfluous or gather yuck. Uh, a man's foreskin, if, if a guy is not real careful and washes himself, what gathers under the foreskin is bacteria and dead skin and yuck sort of stuff and can cause infections and it's dirty and it can be yucky and it can smell if a guy doesn't keep himself clean. And so the foreskin is actually doesn't really serve much of a purpose functionally in the body. So cutting it off actually is helpful for the guy to stay cleaner. It's also helpful for his wife. Uh, European studies have shown in Europe the wives of Jewish men have cervical cancer less frequently than the wives of Gentile men. And the only difference is circumcision. That those Gentile men are not, those men are not washing themselves like they should. This today, I'm sure they are, but this this is years ago. Okay, uh, it was it was showing that the Gentile men who were not washing themselves were subjecting their wives to that bacterial infection that can result in cervical cancer. Now, did Abraham know about cervical cancer? Of course not, but God did. And so God picks this thing that you cut it off of a man. He doesn't really need it. If he doesn't take care of it, it can gather yuck and it can be infected and it can harm people close to him. Circumcision is a symbol 
of God's cutting things away from our life that we don't need, that can be superfluous, that can be harmful to us or harmful to other people. Attitudes, habits, behaviors, choices, that circumcision becomes a physical symbol of God removing those sorts of things from our life. Now, I trust that all of you have been in a relationship with God long enough that he's spoken to you or knocked on you or said, you know, you need to stop that. You need to change that behavior. You need to alter that attitude. You need to adjust that way of relating to people that you have experienced circumcision in your life, if not bodily, then emotionally or spiritually or relationally or financially. You don't need to be spending your money on that kind of stuff, that kind of stupid stuff. Okay, so circumcision becomes this physical representation, this physical symbol of God's removing things from our life that we don't need. And our part is to submit. Now, Abraham was old enough that he submitted. He said, okay, cut it away. Jewish boys are circumcised on the eighth day after they're born. Do they have any say so in the matter? No, they don't. But later on, they get to decide whether they want to live as Jews or not. And that's when they have a bar mitzvah. They become a son of the covenant. But circumcision is a demonstration of how God wants to remove the superfluous, the needless, and sometimes dirty aspects of our life. Why else would God pick circumcision? Well, what's more precious to a guy? Okay. And if, if God, if my relationship with God is supposed to be the primary relationship of my life and God is supposed to be more important to me than anything else, that includes that part of myself that I find so precious. You know, God's really messing with some guys here, isn't he? Okay. Now, women, where does this do for you? Because female circumcision is a completely other thing. That is not anything that God asked for. And that's something culturally that happens not in Judaism, not in Christianity, but in some other cultures. Okay, so female circumcision is nothing like this and not what God's asking for. But aren't you in relationship with God, ladies? Yes, you are. You're in relationship with God through your father, through your brother, or through your husband, or through your son that your father, your brother, your husband, your son, and their circumcision and the blood that they shed when they were circumcised covers you. Now, in today's culture, we go, oh, I, 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 I don't need to be that. But it's actually a gracious thing. You don't have to be circumcised. You didn't have to shed your own blood. Your dad, your brother, your husband, your son did that for you. And you have all the benefits of the covenant without having to go through the pain and the bloodshed of the sign of circumcision. That's a gracious thing. That's a gift. We as Christians, do not we enjoy the benefits of Jesus' death on the cross and his blood shed for us? We don't have to do that. And so the male being circumcised is a precursor and a foreshadow and a preview of what Jesus does for all of us. That as women are included in the covenant by their father's circumcision, their brothers, their husbands, their son's circumcision. So we are included in the covenant with God through Jesus' death on the cross and his bloodshed. We don't have to do that. Thank God. So circumcision, though women were not eligible for circumcision, they're included by virtue of their relationships with some male, and they benefited from his cleanliness. Some other circumcision stuff, as if this weren't enough. Arabs and Jews circumcise their sons because both of them are descended from Abraham. So Muslims circumcise their sons, Jews circumcise their sons. In most of Europe, since uh, throughout the ages, Christian families did not circumcise their sons because that was a Jewish thing. And in World War II, when the Nazis were hunting Jews, 
they could get a room full of guys and pull down their pants, and that was how they decided who was the Jews and who weren't, and who to take to the concentration camps. Now, when the United States soldiers were being captured by the Germans, and they started trying to do the same thing to separate the, the, the Jewish Americans from the non-Jewish Americans, we had to tell them, in America, we circumcise, we, we circumcise our guys. It's not just the Jews that do that. So in the United States culture, we often circumcise our little boys. Uh, and that was great consternation to the Nazis. Good for us. Okay. So Arabs and Jews circumcise their sons because all, all of them des descend from Abraham. Uh, Moses, remember when Moses is born, his mom hides him for three months. And the rule is if you, got a Jew, if you have a little boy, you're supposed to throw him in the Nile. So his mother puts him in a basket in the Nile. She, she does what Pharaoh says to do. She obeys him. The letter of the law puts him in a basket in the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter comes down to take her bath in the morning. She sees this basket. She hears this child crying. She opens it up, and there's this little boy, and she goes, oh, this is one of the Jewish babies. How does she know that? He's circumcised. He's circumcised. Okay. Jeremiah, uh, David, David before he's king, David, um, King Saul, is angry with David because David's getting more famous than Saul is. And the people are singing about David and all of the battles he's won and Saul's getting jealous. And so Saul thinks, I'm going to let, I'm going to set David up to get killed. And uh, David, he finds out that David and Saul's daughter, Michael, have the hots for each other. And so Saul tells, tells David, you can have my daughter and the price for my daughter is 100 Philistine foreskins. Saul's thinking David's going to go out and to kill. If David's going to fight a hundred Philistines, surely somebody's going to kill him. How's he going to kill a hundred Philistines, snip off their foreskins, and come back without getting killed? So that's a safe bet. David goes out and brings back 200 Philistine foreskins. How would you like to count those? Yeah. Now, there is a, uh, there's a mini-series about the Bible that came out several years ago. It's very episodic and it, it, it follows through and it, it has this scene where David comes in with King Saul and he's got this little pouch. And the story in the, in the episode, it doesn't say what's in the pouch. But it does, Saul has told David, you know, you could have my daughter to be married. And David comes in and he gives Saul the pouch and he opens it and he goes, <laughs> that's, unless you read the book, you don't know what he's going with. Okay, so David does that. Just, just some little circumcision fun stories here. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah and Paul both talk about circumcision of the heart. Jeremiah in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, and Paul in Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29, talks about the important circumcision to be in a relationship with God. It's not the circumcision of your flesh, but the circumcision of your heart. That God wants us to remove from our heart, those things that are superfluous, those things that gather dirt, those things that we don't need, those things that may actually be harmful or unhealthy to us and to those around us, that God wants to cut those things away from our heart. And ladies, you can be circumcised of heart. That's really the important part, not the circumcision of the flesh. Okay. So Abraham gets circumcised. Everybody in his household gets circumcised. Um, there's a couple other circumcision stories in there. You've probably heard some of them. We've, do we've done enough of that. Okay. So Abraham enters into this covenant with God, and the symbol of his covenant with God is circumcision, and Jews have done that ever since. Arabs have done that ever since. That's a, a, a sign of their covenant with God. Well, in Genesis chapter 22, uh, by this time he's had Isaac, Isaac is somewhere in his, probably in his teens. We don't know exactly how old Isaac is, but God comes to Abraham and he says, I, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And Abraham says, okay. Abraham doesn't say, say what? He doesn't say, are you sure about this? Abraham doesn't say, is there somebody else up there? In that culture, in many other gods, people sacrifice their children. So when Abraham hears this Lord God ask him to sacrifice his son, he's not at all excited about it. But if God wants that, 
I'll do it. It was not Abraham's idea. He didn't go, well, you know, everybody else sacrifices their kids. I'll do mine. This is, God specifically asks him to do that. Now, God has already told Abraham that Isaac is the son through which I'm going to bless the world. Abraham certainly would have been justified to say, oh, wait a minute, God, isn't this the one? But Abraham doesn't do that. Now, in Hebrews, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about great faith, he says that Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. That Abraham decides he's going to kill Isaac, trusting that even if I kill Isaac, God is going to raise him from the dead. Now, he's going to kill Isaac and burn him up. But the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham figured, okay, I guess if God wants me to kill him and this is the son of promise, God's going to work it out somehow. So Abraham... Early the next morning, the Bible says, early the next morning, he gets up and he saddles his donkey and he gets a fire pot and a knife and a load of wood. And he takes Isaac and he takes a couple of servants and they take off because God says, I want you to sacrifice him on the mountain where I show you. The mountain where God led Abraham was what's now Jerusalem. On what's now where, um, the, what was the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Today on that Temple Mount is the Dome of the Rock, which is in a Muslim shrine and a Muslim mosque. Okay. So Abraham goes to that mountain, and that's where he offers his son. This is also where uh, David sees the angel of the Lord stop when he's killing a bunch of people. You're going to get to that in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. This is also the place that the Muslims say that, Ab that uh, Muhammad took off from earth and went up into heaven to get his visions. So this, is, this, this place in Jerusalem is the holiest place for Jews, the third holiest place for Muslims, and a holy place for us because it's the city in which Jesus was crucified and rose again. Okay. So Abraham goes to Mount Moriah. He gets there at Mount Moriah in the distance. He says to his servants, you stay here. My son and I are going to go make our sacrifice and we will come back. Did you hear the pronoun? We will come back. So what's really going through Abraham's mind? We're not really sure. But Abraham was convinced somehow God's going to work this out. I'm going to offer my son as a sacrifice, but somehow we are going to come back. And on the way up the mountain, Isaac, who has been watching his dad make sacrifices and who knows the routine, says, Dad, there's the wood, there's the knife, there's the fire, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide. God will provide. Abraham gets up to the top, he builds an altar out of stones, he puts the wood on the altar, and the Bible says he ties up his son Isaac. Now, different people think different things about that, that Abraham had to lasso Isaac and tie him up so he wouldn't run away. The rabbis, however, as they have looked at this story, say that Isaac asked to be bound because Isaac understood he was going to be the sacrifice and Isaac believed God enough that he didn't want to flinch, that he didn't want to be there lying on the altar and see the knife coming in and do this. So the rabbis say that, Abraham, that Isaac offered himself to be bound. On the altar. So as Isaac is on the altar tied up, Abraham raises the knife and God says, Abraham, Abraham. Every other time that God calls Abraham, he calls him once. This time he says his name twice. He wants to make sure that Abraham's not paying attention and that Abraham doesn't drop the knife first. Abraham, Abraham. Abraham says, Yes, Lord, here I am. God says, Now I know. Now I understand. You really love me and listen to me. Now, did God not know that? Of course God knew that. God knew that. But now Abraham knows. And then Abraham looks over and there in a thicket right next to him is a ram caught by its horn. Now, do you know how much noise a ram would make if it was caught in a bush? It's going to be, nah, nah, and it's going to be shaking and it's going to be rustling the bush. How could Abraham not have seen that? But he didn't. 
And Abraham notices that there is the ram. And Abraham takes the ram and offers that in place of his son. So this covenant that God has with Abraham, Abraham is tested and he passes the test. Sometimes in our life, God does the same kind of thing with me. I, I, I don't know that he's ever asked me to kill any of my children, because I probably would have at some point. <laughs> but God has asked me sometimes to give up something. And when I gave it up, he let me know it was okay. I didn't have to give it up. We had um, uh, Tim and Terry Weatherington, who were part of our congregation. Terry had the vision to off, to, to, of Messiah Academy. It was going to be a virtual school teaching virtuous living. It was going to be a school that we were going to be able to offer to special needs children. It was going to be a, thing, a place that we were going to teach life skills as well as academics. And so she pitched the idea to me and I said, sure, we're going to we do this. And so we did the market research and we found out how to do it and we found out where to get curriculum and we got some money to do it. And she wanted to be the, the head, the director of it. And the whole time she's telling me about this, this sounds like a great idea, but I'm thinking, I'm not sure Terry can pull this off. And I'm not sure Terry's the right person to be the director. It's a great idea, but I'm not sure Terry's the one that, to do this. And as I prayed, that, that was the, the, the feeling that I got, the impression that I got from God that, that, yes, this was a great idea, and yes, we ought to do it, but Terry's not the one to do it. So... We got the money to do it. We got a grant from the diocese. Uh, and I went to talk to her. And she's making all these great plans to be the director. And I said, Terry, I don't think you're the person to do this. She said, why not? I said, I'm just praying. I get, I get the sense that, that you're not the person. And she didn't get mad. And she didn't cuss at me. And she didn't yell and scream. She said, okay. If you really believe that I'm not the person to do this, we will still support it in any way that we can because this is God's plan and I don't have to be part of this for it to work. I want to do it, but I don't have to be the person to do that. And we prayed together and I left their, their office where I had met with them and I got it out in my car and I had this sense that the Holy Spirit said, she passed. She's the one. That my understanding is that God had done to Terry what he did with Abraham to say, this thing you love, this son you love, will, uh, do you love me enough to give up this son you love, this, this vision that you love? And Terry said, yes. And I turned around and I went right back in and said, you're my girl. I was not testing her. That was not my idea. I'm not that devious. I'm not that smart. But the Holy Spirit is, and God is. And every once in a while, God is going to ask some of us to give up something that we love. And if we are willing to give it up, He might let us have it back. He might not. But He might. Abraham passed the test. Terry Weatherington passed the test. I hope that each of us will pass the test. Well, as Isaac grows up, Abraham decides he needs a wife for this, this guy because if Isaac is my son through whom we're going to have all these descendants, he needs a wife. But he looks around at all the people, all the women that are living around him, and none of them are following the Lord. None of them are, I mean, they're all pagans, and which is not an insult. It's simply a description of people who don't worship the God that we worship, okay? They're worshiping all these other gods, and none of them are acceptable because I want somebody who's part of our tradition, who's part of our faith, who understands this God thing, who's going to help my son, because marriage is a big deal for people. And who we marry influences our, as, our, as, our uh, perspective on life and how our attitudes about all kinds of things. And so this is why marriage is such a big deal in the Bible and for Abraham, and it still is for us. Marriage is a big deal for Abraham, for his son Isaac, and it's a big deal for us too, because Abraham knew that Isaac's faith would stand or fall with his marriage. We all know people who 
have a relationship with God, marry somebody who doesn't, and they struggle about that for years after that. And they either go to church by themselves. We have a number of church widows and widowers here who they come and their spouse doesn't. And it's, it's an irritation. It's, a, it's a, a, a disappointment. It's a, you know, I can't share this thing that's so important with me. They don't think it's important. They don't like it. Sometimes they make fun of it. Or they stay home because, you know, I want us to go together. And if you won't go, then I won't go. Marriage becomes a big deal in our faith story and in our relationship with God. And Abraham wants his son to have a healthy marriage that is going to support him in this relationship with God and not, at least not be an obstacle. So who's Abraham going to think about? Well, the only people I know that know God like I do are my cousins. So Abraham sends a servant back around to what is now Iraq to find his family to get a wife from his family. Now, I don't know that we have to hook up our children with our, their cousins, but God's family is a little bigger now than it was back then. And the best way that Abraham knows to get a suitable wife for his son, who will not only be fertile, we hope, and be kind, we hope, but have this relationship with God, we hope, is to go back to his family. So he does that. Uh, his family were the only people at that point who had the same kind of relationship with God. We have a little wider audience, okay? Uh, we don't need to hook up our kids with their cousins, but what can we parents do and our we grandparents do to increase the likelihood that our children will marry wisely and in the faith, hope, and love of Jesus? That matters. Well, we need to pray for our children. Pray for our children and start before we ever get married. Start long before the kids ever show up to begin to pray for our children, pray for their protection, pray for their relationships, pray for their uh, health, pray for their decisions. Uh, prayer is like money in the bank that you can pray for things before you need it and you can stack up the prayer like money in the bank so that when you need it, the power is there. Is that not why we put money in the bank? to save it up so when we need it later on, there's a stack that's in there. Prayer is the same way, and we can stack up our prayers so that when we need it, the power is there to pray for our children, and then when they show up, to continue to pray for them and to raise our children to know and love the Lord by keeping our baptismal covenant and showing them how to do the same. Now, at every baptism in the Episcopal Church, remember we go through the baptismal covenant of the promises that we make to abide in the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayer, to avoid evil, that when we fall into sin, to repent and return to the Lord, to, to uh, share with other people by word and example the good news of God in Christ, to respect the dignity of every human being, uh, and to love people, like, like to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, we promise to do that. And if we as adults and parents and grandparents do that and our children watch that, they're more likely to imitate and do the same. We have the opportunity to raise our children in the faith, hope, and love of Jesus, to raise them to know the Lord, to bring them to church, to make this part of them. And the liturgy that they hear over and over and over again gets down inside of them and changes them from the inside out. That's why we do what we do a week after week after week. It's so our children hear that stuff and internalize it, and it, it affects how they look at life. It affects how they think. It affects how they act. So we have the chance to do that, to raise them in the covenant and show them how to do the same. Uh, then pray for our children. Pray for them some more. And then teach them faith, hope, and love while they're in our homes and under our roof. Because once they grow up and they're gone, that's too late but to expect our children to act in faith, hope, and love while they're in our house. Uh, I urge parents to bring their kids to church, even if the kids don't want to come, because we don't let them eat anything they want, do we? If they don't like something, do we let them just not eat it? If they don't want to go to school, do we let them stay home? Do, if they don't want to get a shot and an immunization, do we say, oh, okay, well, we don't, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. No, we, we as parents, we make decisions for our children that our children don't like. 
That's our job as parents. It's our job to do what is healthiest for our children, which includes immunizations and nutritious food and treating each other kindly and going to school and doing your homework and coming to church and being active. And when you grow up and you move out of the house, you can do whatever you want to. But if you're in my house, you're coming to church. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to be happy about it. You got to be there. And I urge parents to do that because it gets inside of them. The Bible promises that if you will raise your children in the way that they ought to go, when they are older, they will not depart from it. It doesn't say anything about that middle time. So if your kid's in their late teens and 20s, go off and forget about God and don't care anything about God, that happens. But when they're older, they're more likely to come back if they've had the foundation of the Bible stories and the songs. Because you know those songs get inside of your head and they roll around in there and they're hard to get rid of. And if nothing else, they remember, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they're not going to get away from that. So teach them faith, hope, and love while they're in our house and under our roof and we've got some leverage over them. And then to pray upon them and to impress upon them the wisdom of dating and marrying someone with faith, hope, and love. Now, in our culture today, parents don't arrange their children's marriages, okay? In cultures that parents do arrange their children's marriages, marriages actually have a better track record than our choosing our own mates. The divorce rate is higher in cultures that people choose their own mates than in cultures where they don't. Now, I don't think we're going to go back to parents choosing their children's mates. That's just not going to happen. But there's some wisdom there because parents know their children and parents can sometimes are smarter than their kids are about who they feel it, fall in warmth with. But to impress upon our children how vital it is not to date somebody that you wouldn't consider marrying. Because, you know, you fall in love and, oh, well, you know, I'm if I thought about it, I probably wouldn't marry him. But we fall in love and it's really good and we love each other and we laugh and all that sort of. And then later on, the warmth wears off and there you are stuck with him. But to date in the faith, hope and love of Jesus, uh, to continue to pray for them and to meet anybody that they might consider marrying. And in my family, you don't have to do this, but in, in my family, um, the rule was with our children, you cannot date anybody until they've come and shared a meal with our family. That's pretty oppressive, isn't it? Our two sons did that. Anybody that they dated, they brought them to the house first and we had a meal together. We weren't grilling them. We weren't asking them about their faith. We weren't saying, do you know Jesus? We just wanted to get to know this person. First of all, if somebody wasn't willing to meet the family, that says something. They don't need to be with my kid. But they came and, and they saw how we acted with each other and they saw how we loved each other and they saw how we treated each other and how we were courteous to each other and they saw that we had manners with each other. And you know, if, if you don't want to be part of that, you don't need to be dating my son. My oldest son goes to college and he's bringing these girls home from college because he wants to go out with them and he brings them home for a meal. And we're like, Timothy, you don't have to do this anymore. You're, you know, you're a grown man now, you're off of college, you're 200 miles, just date whoever you want to because we trust you now. But he continued to do that. My daughter just didn't date anybody while she was in high school. She just said, I'm not doing that, that's stupid. So she sneaked around, she didn't, she, she didn't. The one guy she brought home was not someone that her mother and I thought was suitable. And the good news was he was not old enough to drive. So for him to get home, I had to take him home. And we had a conversation in the car of how this is my precious daughter, whom I love more than life itself. And if you mistreat my daughter, it will not go well with you. <laughs> now, I didn't sharpen my knife. I wasn't cleaning my pistol. I wasn't doing any of that. But I just let him know that my daughter was the most precious person in my life. And if he was going to spend time with her, he needed to treat her kindly. Well, years later, my daughter said, you scared the hell out of him. And I said, good. And they didn't date very much longer. I won. She won.
Okay, so meet the people they date, certainly any that they might consider marrying. Pray for them, and then finally you trust God with your children. You have to. They grow up, they leave. But if you've built the foundation with your children, with your grandchildren, with your nieces and nephews, there's more likely that that covenant that they establish with another human being will be a healthy one. Okay, other covenants in the Bible. The law of Moses comes at Sinai. Uh, the Ten Commandments and the 613 other commandments. David has a covenant with God. God makes a covenant with David that you will always have a son on the throne of Israel. Jesus is a descendant of King David, and he's our king that is the promise of that, the fulfillment of that promise to David. And finally, the new covenant of the law that's written on our hearts that Jeremiah prophesies in Jeremiah 31, and the sign of our covenant with God as Christians is baptism, which can be for males and females. So ladies, God didn't forget you. He didn't leave you out. You're part of the covenant now, just like guys are. So covenants, God makes covenants with us and he always keeps his part of the covenant, whether we do or not, but let's try it. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.